everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for being here. My name is Tran Mendez, and I am an academic trainer with the Center for Teaching and Learning. And today we have a special treat. We have Gary Walker Roberts, one of our doctoral candidates, and he will be presenting today's content. As you know, uh, this uh, month of June is Pride Month, and Gary's going to be going over the history of the movement as well as our call to action for inclusion and equality. We are so happy and excited for you to be here with us today, here, Gary. And before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping items to take care of. I want to remind everybody that this webinar is being recorded and I will post uh, the video in the comments within the next couple of days. If you don't have access to the comments, just send an email to ctl at ncu.edu and I'll make sure that you have the recording. And throughout today's time, if you have any questions at all, please use the Q&A in the chat box. And I will make sure that Gary addresses your questions and your comments. In the event that we run out of time and we don't have time to go over your question, I will send those over to Gary and we'll make sure that they are addressed. Um, just use the tools at the bottom of your screen if you're using the uh, web browser. And if you're using the app, you might have to scroll a little bit on your phone or um, uh, iPad and um, access the tools that way. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Tran. So first and foremost, cheers. Happy Pride, everyone. Yes. So first and foremost, I'm going to share my screen. And here we are. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Walker Roberts, and I will be conducting today's webinar. I am a doctoral candidate at North Central University, and I'm so excited that they gave us this platform to have this discussion to go over all things LGBTQIA, pride, and calls to action. I work full time in the cosmetic industry, but I teach adjunct, uh, I'm an adjunct professor at, in the Contra Costa Community College uh, District. So we will be recording today's session as Tran said. If you want to mute yourself, just hover over your picture and you could mute and Tran will, uh, she will field the questions that come up throughout the presentation. So let's celebrate, let's get started. So the shot glass heard around the world. Let's start with today's rules of engagement. So today's rules of engagement, um, I would like to go over is that we wanna create a safe space for everybody. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are coming at today with love, we understand each other. We all come from different sets of backgrounds, different life experiences, and we really wanna make sure that we're using our positive language and we're being uh, really reserving judgment, but exercising patience, understanding, love, inclusivity, uh, respect, dignity, dignity and positive energy from all. So first and foremost, you see the rainbow colors before you. So today's pre presentation aims to give you content and framework on the LGBTQIA plus use of the rainbow flag, why gay pride, LGBT plus pride is in June, the need for the symbol, a little bit of framework in historical context, review terminology and inclusive language, updates on current events that are happening now, and some call to actions, how you can participate in Pride Month and or become an activist and advocate for our community. And a little about me and why I advocate, especially for the transgender community. So let's get started. Why the rainbow flag? So the rainbow flag is a symbol of pride and solidarity. It was uh, introduced to the LGBT community and allies in the 1970s in San Francisco. However, the movement had started way before the 70s um, with our historical context. Today, the rainbow flag is the most recognized LGBTQIA plus symbol around the world. And it, I would like to take a minute just to go over what the colors stand for. The red is passion and vitality orange creativity and practicality and playfulness. Yellow, my favorite, is sunshine, clarity, wisdom, and positive energy. Green, 
fertility, growth, balance, blue, spirituality, and divinity, indigo, self-awareness, and enchantment, violet, imagination, and highest spirituality. You may also see that black and brown colors on the rainbow flag. And this has been added to the flag so that we are more inclusive and it stands for beauty, strength, to honor people of color. Then what I'd like to do is just go over a, a little bit of uh, language and terminology for the LGBTQIA plus and what they stand for and why that plus is very important. So LGBT has been around for a while. So I think, you know, you understand a little bit of the L being lesbian, G being gay, B bisexual, T for trans folks, Q for questioning or queer, I for intersex, and A for ally or asexual. The A is a wonderful uh, letter to represent for ally and asexual, but ally makes our community very inclusive. So straight folk can certainly be represented under the rainbow flag. Um, they are our allies and the LGBTQIA plus percentage in the world is obviously a little bit smaller than uh, those of our, our counterparts, straight individuals. Um, but allies are certainly helping us lead the charge and really making sure that our history is known and also advocating for equality, inclusive and equity whether it be in education, academia, or in the workforce today. The plus is all other identities, such as two-spirit or gender non-conforming. Today we'll go over a lot of gender non-conforming and what that means, but two-spirit comes from our Native Americans, um, and that is a, a representation of individuals who uh, you know, express both genders because you know gender is binary but back in, before colonization the native americans had multiple genders they didn't have language uh, such as transgender or gender non-conforming so uh, recently currently the native americans came up with a word two spirit to really embody both expressions of individual expressions of male and female uh, for, for any individual who does not fit into the binary. I also wanted to make mention here that all, the LGBTQIA community is the only minority community that spans across all other groups, such as ethnicity, race, gender, religions, creed. So these terms are, are very important. Uh, you know, we talk about language and how language is important, um, but it, here are some of the definitions. One of the terminologies that I wanted to go over was asexual. And as you can see on the screen, it says someone who does not experience sexual attraction. Yes, there are individuals that do not experience sexual attraction for anybody, and that's okay. But as you see more LGBTQIA plus people coming forward out of the closet, if you will, asexuals still are, are certainly stigmatized by our society because it's hard for some people to really understand or wrap their head around how a human being could, could have no sexual attraction toward anyone. Pansexual is another one that's not up here, but pansexual is somebody who is attracted to every, everybody. It doesn't matter their gender or, um, you know, their sexuality. They are attracted to all people. So they, you know, certainly are attracted to non-conforming, gender non-conforming people and or somebody who, uh, who categorizes themselves as straight or, um, I'm sorry, as gender, uh, female or male. So they, will, they can fall in love with anybody and they're sexually attracted to anybody. So these terms really have their own definitions, but here's the thing, we're constantly evolving. So if, if you come in contact with somebody who tells you how they identify, and that's their right to identify however they choose, then just have that respect to really embrace them and understand them. The other thing about questioning that I like is that we're giving you uh, the freedom and the ability to, to ask questions. You know, if somebody doesn't understand something or, you know, per, perhaps gender pronouns, have 
the courage to, you know, have a conversation and ask because education is always the key to really helping to be more inclusive, accepting, and equal. Why June? So a lot of people ask me, why June for, for your LGBTQIA pride? And the other thing that I want to take a moment to talk to you about is you, you heard me say gay pride earlier. We used to say gay pride and I, I said it and now I'm back to LGBTQIA pride um, because gay pride only was including gay people. And our history is so robust that it goes beyond gay pride. So we are saying LGBTQIA plus pride. And again, it's, it's language. So language takes practice to become perfect. So the more you practice it, the more you will be able to have it come off uh, as authentic and roll off the tip of your tongue. I work with many politicians sometimes and they get a little confused or they, they trip over LGBTQIA plus and, and sometimes they avoid saying it because they don't want to, to be wrong or they don't want to trip over it. Uh, and I say, just keep practicing. We, again, are going to be very forgiving and it's, it's about the effort. And that more effort you put forward, the better, uh, better you're going to get. So the reason June is LGBTQIA Pride Month is because it was the shot glass heard around the world which was in June, 1969. But as you could see, this is a very small on the screen. And here's the web address that you can pull this up bigger uh, so that you could see the robust history starting in 1867 all the way to uh, 2016. And of course, we continue to expand our history. But I wanna really focus in and zoom into 1969. 1969, the police raided the Stonewall Inn in New York City, which was an establishment for LGBTQIA people to go and to have camaraderie and to have a drink and to dance. And, and, and the, the riots uh, started um, in 1969, but it wasn't the first time that the police of New York City were harassing um, the LGBTQIA plus community, especially the trans community. And the shot glass that was heard around the world um, was actually done and banged uh, on the mirror by um, Marsha P. Johnson, who we'll talk about. So she was a, a trans, uh, trans individual, and that actually started the riots. However, in Times, if you could see here, it talks about Stonewall in, uh, in 1969. And as you could read, it says, where most patrons are gay, or people of color, um, they have eliminated or they left out uh, the specific trans folk. So trans folk have been uh, or felt as if they, their visibility in our culture has not been elevated. And that's one of the reasons why I focus on that today. Oh, let me go back, let me see. Oh, and in 1969, the Compton's Cafeteria riots also were happening um, in San Francisco, and, and that was an establishment, uh, again, uh, for LGBTQI patrons, but again, a very large um, community of trans women of color and trans people, and they also were pushing back. Because I, I, back in 1969, um, you know, it was illegal. There were a lot of laws on the books, and, um, you know, it was illegal. You could be arrested for, for wearing uh, different garments that did not represent the gender in which you were born. The next slide that I wanted to go over with you is hot off the press. I think this is very important and a call to action. The New York City Police Department just yesterday publicly apologized for the Stonewall uh, raids on, on the, for the commemorative 50 year anniversary. So um, as you can see here, you have the New York, uh, New York Police Department. Uh, he made a statement to apologize. This is a huge step to acknowledge that, you know, the harassment that the police officers of New York City were, um, you know, inappropriate and uh, it's, it's a small gesture. Uh, but the big thing is we also advocate for raising of the flag. So underneath the flag of um, the rainbow colors, it lets LGBTQIA plus people feel the, the, the safety feel the acceptance somewhere that they can go to be themselves. 
So you will see this in academia, on classroom doors, um, you will see this in, uh, in offices or anywhere, um, homes, but that just lets you know that they can find safe haven or a safe place to really uh, feel comfortable to be themselves and there's no judgment and in, in return there's love and patience uh, and so it's very important that we raise the flag in municipalities, so in your communities. Uh, there was just an incident here in Dublin, California, um, where the city council voted not to raise the flag. And they had a very ugly meeting, um, but they did this past week revote and they raised the flag this week. So it was, it was uh, an outcry from the community especially from our allies and the city council reversed and they raised the flag. Just that small gesture lets towns, lets institutions such as North Central University that they support the LGBTQIA plus community. And that means something to us. You know, it, it means uh, that we're accepted. It means that they see us and every human being wants to be seen, especially if they've come from an oppressed group. This article evokes, uh, elevates the role of trans folks. So if, if you, as you can see, um, James uh, Falerino, the media director for Heritage of Pride, who puts on uh, the LGBTQIA plus pride parade in New York City, he acknowledges that, that you know, um, in particular, trans folks and people of color and their role that they played in uh, the LGBTQIA plus liberation to really start the momentum to to have laws change and our society start to really notice the LGBTQIA plus community. Why does it matter? I hear a lot of things like why a whole month? Why not just one day? Uh, why isn't there straight pride? Um, but why does it matter? Because the LGBTQIA plus community has been oppressed um, after colonization. So it, there's historical con context in my scholar, scholarly book that we'll go to that talks about the history. But back in uh, Greece, Roman, uh, Native American times, there was a fluidity on gender and sexuality uh, that you know, we survived. Um, one of my favorites to talk about is the Hawaiian culture. And in the Hawaiian culture, there's the Mahueni or the Mahu, which is a broad term for the LGBTQIA plus uh, community, um, but also for the transgender nonconforming community. And back in the day, back in history, the LGBTQIA plus individuals were celebrated. They uh, were gifts from God. Uh, they were the shamans and the teachers of society. So they really um, were elevated and they were able to thrive in society. It wasn't until colonization to where the, the gender binary and the sexuality binary system and processes were put into place. So let's talk about today and current. Why does it matter that we have gay pride or LGBTQIA plus pride? Is that these four, um, these four statistics from the Human Rights Campaign. And as you can see, the equal, equal sign for equality is the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, they are a reliable resource that you could use when you uh, are looking for statistics. So the first one says that four in 10 LGBT youth say the community in which they live is not accepting of LGBT QIA plus people. Um, this is why it's important that we get involved uh, politically, socially with our communities because it's at the community level that we could raise the, the flags and it shows, the symbol shows again what I talked about earlier, how that our youth can thrive in our communities and that the policymakers, the lawmakers, they believe in the LGBTQI plus equality and acceptance. So that's why I put this one up here because I think it's very important, especially this month, that we advocate for the rainbow flag to be flown. And the rainbow flag, you know, when you stop and hear, I'm in Hawaii right now, but when you see the rainbow, it just makes you stop, look up and realize how beautiful the rainbow is. And that really embodies all of us that are in the LGBTQIA plus community. Two times 
This one is the LGBT youth are twice as likely as their peers to say they have been physically assaulted, kicked, or shoved at school. So this is very important to highlight because, yeah, because of society's ideology that has been subjected to all of us since we've been younger or, uh, you know, look at the media. The media shapes our ideology on gender and sexuality. Um, and because of this, they are other organizations as well. Um, and, and what happens is they embody that it becomes their ideology and then they express it uh, by physically assaulting and, and hurting people. 75% of LGBT youth say that most of their peers do not have a problem with their identity as LGBTQIA+. So this one's pretty interesting. So the youth, 75%, which I think is a huge percentage, does not have any issues with uh, queer folk. And the thing that I want to highlight about that is that this block of, of youth, they're not in our politics yet. They're not voting yet. So, you know, as we advocate for the LGBTQIA plus community, it's very important that we, uh, you know, uh, give them a voice, teach them how to be advocates, get them involved politically, um, and I just wanted to mention that I'm very proud of our, our um, K-12 school district, the Antioch uh, Unified School District in California. Their, um, their school district voted to raise the, the uh, rainbow flag on campuses. So I think that's very important. And I think it just goes to show that, again, 75% of the youth are accepting of the community. And it's just, it, it takes us to really convince or to advocate to those who already are in office or in those powerful leadership positions. The last one is over three quarters, 77% of LGBT youth say they know things will get better. So that's where hope comes in, right? So yes, we've seen huge strides, um, but we've also seen a regression with this administration. Uh, and one of those being that there's a ban on transgender individuals from serving in our military. So, you know, there are states in the United States uh, that are fighting bathroom bills, the, um, the ability to allow acad academic institutions or public institutions to offer gender neutral restrooms for people, uh, trans people and queer people. I feel more comfortable going into a gender neutral restroom or a family restroom. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. But there is hope, but we still have a lot to do. We have a long way to go, and that's why education is so super important. More importantly, I think it's, it's very important to elevate um, you know, Pride Month because it can be the difference between life and death. So here you see the suicide uh, rates, um, and they're extremely high. I'm not gonna go through all of those, um, but it's, it's just very important to recognize you know, that um, LGBTQIA individuals, they experience all of those negative physical assaults. Um, I believe in free speech, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, there is a fine line between free speech and hate speech. So our society continues to navigate through those. Uh, one derogatory term that I wanted to go over um, are faggot, um, dykes, trannies, those are all derogatory terms that, that people use. Queer uh, was a derogatory term uh, that, you know, straight folk or folk in general used to degrade the uh, community. However, we have reclaimed queer. So, you know, you'll hear many people say queer uh, and it's okay, but we've reclaimed that language but it's always giving from the heart. So you know somebody's heart. If somebody is calling you a derogatory term in the context of um, hatred, then you know, that is unacceptable and we have to filter those, uh, those situations and we have to be very, very confident and uh, acknowledge when it happens, whether we're in a classroom, whether at work, um, you know, your safety always comes first, but you want to make sure that you let them know that it's unacceptable uh, to use hateful language. Um, and certainly in those, uh, those areas of, of academia and the classroom, uh, especially cyberbullying, 
uh, North Central University, we are a platform of online education. So, you know, online education, we're expressing through words that we're typing. Uh, so we need to be really cognizant of, of making sure that we're intercepting when, uh, when we need to and being there to help navigate any bully, bullying situations. So speaking of us moving forward, I would like to talk about equal rights under the law, the benefits, because a lot of people think that, you know, oh, under the American flag, we're all equal. We all want to um, have the same thing. So we're all Americans first, and we don't need to segregate into Black Lives Matter, LGBTQI plus community, um, et cetera, et cetera. However, I wanted to just share this with you because uh, Jason, my husband, you see him here, Jason and I got married in June 2015. And that was uh, the day before the 27th. So it was uh, the day after Obama had announced that uh, the Supreme Court ruled that marriage equality was going to go through. Yay. So it was really, really awesome. We were excited. We were here in Hawaii. Um, but one thing I want you to notice is my gender expression, even on my um, wedding day. So a funny little thing, the, uh, mar the Marriage Equality Act or Act of Marriage Equality, they posted this on, um, on their Instagram, Facebook. And uh, it was really cute because we got so many uh, different comments, uh, but they actually thought that we were a lesbian couple. And so, uh, you know, I told my husband and we celebrated. I mean, there's, a, hey, we could be that too. Uh, but it's just to it goes to show that they thought that I was a female because I'm wearing and an, an endure, uh, 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 wearing a lot of the Hawaiian culture, what they would say would be like the, the feminine um, wear with the grass skirt and the hoku and the lays. So I just wanted to put that in there just to show you a little bit of how I do um, gender nonconforming expressions. And then also another equal rights under the law. Uh, some of the benefits that, you know, we now uh, get to enjoy. So my husband was able to retire from the Marine Corps in 2012. That's him in his dress blue, so handsome. And he served 24 years and retired, like I said, from the Marine Corps. So the entire time um, that he was in the Marine Corps, he had to go through some phases. So he served 22 years in the closet and two years out. So um, think about that, 20 years he served in the Marine Corps that he wasn't able to express anything about, uh, you know, the, the love part of his life. Um, don't Ask, Don't Tell did come into place and it was uh, repealed under President Barack Obama, but uh, President Clinton enacted Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was a step forward. So basically you weren't allowed to ask, they weren't allowed to go to gay establishments and hunt out, they would look for decals, the Marine Corps decal, any DOD decal, and they would wave to see who's getting in the vehicles and then they would get fired from their job. So Jason had to navigate that space very, very, um, very, very carefully. Uh, but Jason and I have been together for 18 years. So out of those years, um, I struggled with it because Jason's life, work life, and we spend a lot of time at work, would start at the Marine Corps uh, gates. And then beyond that, I, have I had no idea what was happening uh, so when he went into uh, our on base, he was a totally different person, right? And so I was too. But what I did is I started to advocate for other LGBTQIA plus uh, individuals that were serving in the, the armed forces at that time. So we would have secret parties. Um, we would invite people over for social events. And so that was the way that we got to express um, who we were. Uh, but um, Gladly, after uh, President Barack Obama um, repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I was able to attend Jason's retirement ceremony, and this is it right here in North Carolina, and I really felt equal treatment, and I was recognized as a, a co-equal or an equal as his spouse. So I really felt really good about that, and I do have my military ID, so I have my spousal ID, and I do take advantage of it, and I go to the base a lot just because there were so many years that I wasn't able to enjoy that. So this is me. My passion for advocating for transgender rights started a long time ago, but then um, I got my uh, bachelor's in ethnic studies, gender and sexuality 
uh, in 2015 from California State University of East Bay. But I had been expressing uh, my gender, uh, uh, my gender expression as, you know, um, nonconforming or female uh, throughout all of my years. So these are just a couple of pictures. I wanted to take a pause here before we move on uh, to the hot off the press for the call to action with trans rights to check in with Tran and see if there were any questions. Sure. And we are at about the halfway mark. Thank and you. We have um, a question from Dr. Aaron Hoffer. Um, Aloha. Okay. Aloha. I, <laughs> I like to welcome students to my courses with an email asking them about their backgrounds and which pronoun they prefer. Um, are practices like this helpful? What other practices can you recommend to welcome people to our courses or groups? Yes, thank you, doctor. That is very helpful. And, and like I said, don't be ashamed to ask somebody what gender pronoun um, that they would uh, prefer to use. Here's a little best practice. Um, sometimes we look at gender expression. So if we're not sure, we ask. But then if there's somebody who may not fit the stereotype of what attire looks like or, or, or a makeup looks like, um, how they're expressing, we don't ask them. So if you do ask uh, what gender pronoun that they prefer in an in-person class, make sure that you're consistent with everybody so you're not singling out one person. So I think that's awesome. And then a second way to be able to be inclusive is just to make sure uh, that we're, we're you, oh, and it's on the next slide actually, so the person's dead name, um, but make sure that you're using the trans individual or whomever, um, use their preferred name. So, you know, you're not calling out, if it's an in class, you're not calling, uh, you know, their biological or dead name, they like to refer to it as, um, but you're, you're consistent with making sure that you're not uh, outing them in front of the class. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm not sure about like North Central University and their, and their platform, uh, but you know, if, you're, if they're in an online class, sometimes you know, their name will come up as, as their old name, uh, their dead name, and the university can make sure that they're putting all of, uh, the, um, all of the platforms to make sure that it says the preferred name. So thank you for that question. I hope I got some uh, answers for you. Do you want to take one more? Um, I don't see any more questions, uh, but we do have a couple comments. Uh, we have um, from Dr. James Gigli Giglielo. I'm very excited about this webinar. I hung out with Marsha Johnson and Sylvia Rivera for years. And then from Tara Lehan, great shirt, Gary. Uh, thank you for leading this discussion. Happy Pride, y'all. Thank you, you too, and congratulations, uh, Dr. James. So, you know, we are going to have on your um, on your graduation, I think, next month. Uh, we uh, are going to have a discussion, question, feedback, kind of uh, at the end. So, stay tuned, and I would love to hear some of the stories. And you know, with Marsha P. Johnson, do you know James exactly what I'm talking about? So, if you'd like to share a story, that would be wonderful. Also, with the shirt, Tran, did you tell everybody the shirt you can purchase? on the NCU platform? Not yet. Um, I will share the link in the chat box here. You can get your very own NCU Pride shirt. And hat. And hat. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Um, so let's continue. So like uh, the call to action, hot off the press, um, just today, uh, the Human Rights Campaign reported uh, the sixth trans woman of color killed in 2019. This is a huge problem. There were 26 murders uh, that were recorded, uh, that we know of, of trans women of color in 2018. This has to stop. Uh, I would like to take a minute. Sorry. I'd like to take a minute to just um, a moment of silence for Chanel Scurlock. Thank you. So one thing that we can do uh, to advocate for the trans community is put on our calendar Trans Day of Remembrance, which happens in November. I also want you to be aware of the trans flag, which is flying next to Chanel. Um, but, uh, you know, there is 
uh, the specific flag for transgender individuals. Um, and you could read the story about um, Chanel, uh, that she was shot. So the statistics of trans physical attacks, murders, are very heinous, and sometimes the, the uh, police departments don't take them very seriously. They devalue the human uh, in trans individuals. And also another problem that we need to really make sure we're advocating for is that news outlets, journalists, they do not respect the dead name. Um, and I'll go over the dead name of the person um, or the proper gender pronouns of the person. So they're constantly misgendering and misnaming the trans folk that uh, we see all over media. And that's the, the worst kind of, of misgendering um, after your death, right? So we really need to continue to really advocate in that area. Never misgender a nonconforming person um, intentionally. I think this is very important and, and to um, doctor's point earlier, you need to make sure, or I would suggest, uh, that you're keen to that as well. Like you're listening in, you know, you know somebody's heart, you know when somebody's coming at it, uh, you know, intentionally doing it um, because they, they have ideologies that, that don't fit the narrative of a uh, trans uh, folk or the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and you yourself, you know, I had to check myself, you know, it's a growing process. Uh, so, you know, making sure that we're not doing it on purpose and there is room for mistakes. And I talk about this a lot. You know, I've done seminars, I've been on panels where I've incorrectly said the wrong pronoun, right? Just by accident. And then I got all like, oh, all, all self-conscious about it. Or that I, I misgendered somebody and they corrected me. All I do is simply apologize and uh, move forward and just make sure that I try not to do it again. Okay, never use a trans person's dead name for safety reasons. The dead name is the name that shows up on their birth certificate, which I think is a, is a great segue into what cisgender means. Cisgender is the gender that they identify on your birth certificate. Okay, so that is a cisgender person identifies in which the gender sex, they were markered on their birth certificate. Other than that, it is into, you know, gender nonconforming. And I believe California is a state where you can be gender nonconforming on your driver's license. I need to do that. But that would be a step in my advocacy as well, because they offer that. I need to, that's a call to action for me. I'm going to change it. Uh, we need to remove the stigma placed on men who are attracted to trans people. In many cases, the trans woman of color is, is usually the one who is getting assaulted or, or murdered. Um, and it's usually by a, their lover or somebody who they are, are with. And they, uh, you know, they, they are struggling with that stigma and, and not to, you know, certainly bl blame uh, the victim here because that's not what we're doing. But what we need to do is, is help society move toward a more equal, equitable society that allows uh, men to certainly express and, and, and really um, be unashamed of loving a trans person or being attracted to a trans person. So gender identity versus sexual orientation. So I, I think this is a very important uh, topic to talk about, the, gen, the gender unicorn. So this is online. Um, certainly uh, you can see that gender identity versus sexual orientation completely different. And as, as with the unicorn, you see the heart and you also see the, um, the helix for the DNA uh, for, for sex assigned at birth. Uh, so this is just a nice little one pager that shows the difference between gender and sex and sexuality. So sex is, again, going back to that birth certificate, in which is the body part in which you are born with. But remember, there is also intersexual, which was on one of my slides before, which is where the individual is born with both anatomy or with and I hate saying both because then I put it in the binary, but they are born um, the way that they are, and it's intersex. 
So there's, there's where you could see the sex assigned at birth, uh, physical attraction in the heart. That is your sexuality. Emotional attraction is in the heart. Um, and gender expression. So gender expression is in, is in the mind. So, you know, my, my uh, sex autonomy is male, but I do ex gender express differently um, in a non-conforming way. So the, this is also from the Trans Student Educational Resource, which is a great resource to have for you uh, to navigate the space when you talk about LGBTQIA+. Uh, individuals or teaching or uh, you want to just have more knowledge yourself. Another way that you can help advocate is through language and characteristics. So the binary is all around us and characteristics and what I wanted to go over here, you all uh, probably know this, but you know one of the oldest is pink for girls, blue colors for boys, toys go to Target, see how there's segregation in the binary, bathrooms, um, you know, I, uh, the article on the right is where I uh, advocated for gender neutral facilities at the local uh, community college district where I work. Um, and we, uh, you know, switched over all of the bathrooms that could be gender neutral. And then also with building new buildings going forward, we always strategically placed uh, gender neutral restrooms around the campus because uh, what we found is trans individuals, non-conforming individuals, uh, they, would, um, they would take longer in the community college system because they had to marry their class schedule to where the bathrooms were because they only felt comfortable using a family bathroom. It's also for our disabled community. I brought that up a lot to the Board of um, Education as well. There's, uh, you know, uh, disabilities. We had a student who had a walking disability and her husband had to help her to the bathroom. So he would wait on campus while she was taking class and, and help her to the restroom, but they had to find a gender neutral or a family bathroom. So, I mean, across the board, this is helping with equity issues to really uh, make sure everybody feels comfortable in, in, uh, in public. Also, I wanted to highlight uh, dress and fashion and suits, um, but most importantly, sports, football versus gymnastics or cheerleading. I did winter guard, which was color guard, spinning the, the rifles and banners, which was typically a female thing to do. But here is Ronan, and Ronan is a sixth grader on the bottom of your screen to the left, and he committed suicide in 2014 because he was bullied for being a cheerleader. So yes, these gender binary roles and characteristics do cause harm to the community. What we can do, we can use inclusive language for a call to action. So when we greet each other, so avoid using ladies, gentlemen, ma'am, sir, girls, guys, etc. And here's a consideration that you could use, like folks, uh, you've heard me using that today. Hi, everyone, uh, you could use that. Uh, but be very mindful of your language um, to make sure that you're inclusive. And again, it goes back to, you know, you have to, to practice. Make, make sure that you practice. You can be wrong. I used to say, hey, guys, all the time, right? Until my feminist friends were like, hey, stop using guys. So, you know, I, I made mistakes, but I'm pretty comfortable now using the inclusive language. But again, it does take practice and be forgiving on yourself. Here's the use of preferred uh, pronouns. So you know the basic she, he, and then they and C or uh, um, er. So here is a great, uh, just a, a one pager, but there are also more um, pronouns. And it always goes back to, um, again, I keep highlighting uh, the doctor, I forgot doctor's name from NCU, uh, but you know, be very upfront and bold, asking you know, what, pr what uh, pronoun would you like me to use? And um, certainly I think that is uh, acceptable. Uh, there is a company that I work in because I work in cosmetics full time, but Sephora, I'm in Sephora's every day. And they are so leading the, the way for using proper pronouns. You may visit a Sephora door and they will have pins that say she, he, they, Z. Um, and, and it shows you right there on a pin how they would like to be addressed. Um, you also can go to YouTube. Uh, one of my favorites is Sephora. Uh, 
Sephora uh, Pride 2019. So go watch that. You'll see how they're utilizing the pins and they're really encouraging them to ask their clients as well. So I was gonna take you to my trans visibility. This is a great resource that you could use. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing here. I'm going to go to share. There we go. So I like the saying, you can't hate people that you know, right? So this was my master's project from Arizona State University. And I wanted to introduce you to a couple of things. So let's just go to um, basic transgender. And you could um, see this as well. It talks about the history. It has a great video on what we talked about with the, the, um, the gender unicorn. So you can see that it has embedded uh, clippings. Um, Christine Jorgensen, so it just introduces you to some people. Christine Jorgensen was one of the first known uh, trans reassignment surgery, uh, for, and she died in 1989, uh, but she had her surgery in, in 1954. She had to leave the country, and uh, she came back to the U.S., um, and she identified as female. So, you know, it, it just goes back into to our history to show um, that there are many people out there who in our past have, have also been gender nonconforming. So Dr. James, we're gonna go to Marsha, one of my favorites, and who I mimicked my shot glass after because Marsha P. Johnson, she was the shot glass that was heard, her shot glass was the shot glass that was heard around the world. And it, uh, it's a great um, way to celebrate gay pride, to commemorate her and her strength and her courage. And uh, there's a video here. Uh, this is Pay It No Mind, The Life and Times of Marsha P. Johnson. Um, and it's a great video, so you could watch this. Uh, it also navigates the space between what, you know, what, how do we identify like RuPaul's Drag Race? What's a drag queen? A gay or cis person dressed up as a woman for entertainment? What is transgender? How did uh, the term transgender evolve from transvestite to transsexual to transgender and why that happened? Um, so there's a lot of uh, a great history here uh, and maybe we'll talk about it with James, James at the end, uh, but just so you know, you could go and, and look. I wanna be inclusive uh, to show Sean. You can follow Sean on uh, social media, uh, Instagram or Facebook. He is an athletic trainer, um, so he's awesome, and he's a trans man, so he uh, transitioned from female to male, uh, but he's got a great story, uh, and there's a lot of context on passing. And then the last person I wanted to show you was Janet Mock, who is really, really in the scene now advocating for trans rights, um, especially for trans women of color. And I had the opportunity to really sit down with her. We brought her to, to the community college in California and she did a great piece on um, her book, Redefining Realness. There's some videos, I don't have time to play, but you can certainly, uh, you could certainly look at those later. And then here is, the diversity highlight when she was on campus with us. And this is her book. It's a great resource. You can integrate it into your classrooms. You could read it. It's a great summer read, um, but it's absolutely fantastic. And Janet uh, identifies as a uh, trans woman of color and she um, has Hawaiian background and grew up in Oakland. So I think that would be a really great read for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. We'll go back to my slideshow. And we'll move into the ending slides, which I have our resources. Um, so 
I am not an expert. I am a scholar. I do have my degree, but you know, there are certain, um, certain areas that I am not 100% the expert, like suicide prevention, medical issues, psychological issues. So I think it's very important when we talk about the LGBTQIA plus community that we have the best resources at hand. Sorry, I have to take you through all of this. Um, but I want you to just see this. You could always Google, uh, you could always use um, counselors that are um, at your campuses or at work, but you have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can have text, uh, the Trevor Project, uh, Trans Life. So these are resources that I want you to put on um, your radar. I also want to just celebrate North Central University. Oh my gosh, what an honor it's been to have them ask me to do this presentation. I hope you found it informative and helpful. But there's another follow-up. There's one on Monday, June 17th. So, um, you know, really uh, look forward to this one on the 17th. It's all month long, our celebration. And you can register for that one to see Dr. Judith and Dr. Beth and Dr. Valerie. So I can't wait to watch that one as well. So in closing, I would like to say thank you so much to the NCU community, especially to Molly, Tran, Chelsea, and the president, uh, Mr. David Harpool, for just giving us this platform to really have this discussion today, for me to give a LGBTQIA plus pride uh, celebration 101. And I hope you enjoyed the celebration as well. Um, I really don't have anything in here, but another shot to us. A shout to everyone who stayed with us the entire time. And thank you, thank you, thank you. You can follow me at Gary Simeon Walker, my handle for Instagram, and there's my email address below. So without further ado, I would like to bring Tran back in um, for a couple of minutes. I think we have like 10 minutes, nine minutes for just a, an all-inclusive discussion um, to hear voices uh, and to celebrate. Thank you, Tran. Yes. You're welcome and thank you. We really enjoyed the presentation here today. I'm going to go ahead and speak on behalf of everybody that was here. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that came through. Uh, the first one is from Nicholas Orr. Great job. Uh, knowledge for human resource professionals uh, should be incorporated, incorporated into leadership courses. And then from um, Claire, we've got, I have not seen Z before. Do you have the background on that pronoun? Yeah, so Z is a non-conforming um, non pronoun. So it, 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 and you could YouTube it and, and they have like robust uh, conversations about it. Uh, but I, in terms of historical why they chose Z, I know Dr. James is on if he uh, or anybody who is really knowledgeable um, in the LGBTQIA plus community and knows that specific answer, um, they may jump in. Um, but again, I, I think it's, uh, it certainly uh, comes from the community. Uh, may, I, may I say something? Yes, of course, Dr. James. Yes, uh, Jim is fine. I'm not formal. Um, uh, the term Z, Zim, and Zer actually, to the best of my knowledge, started in 2013. It's actually the newest of all the pronouns. I sit on the Transgender Advisory Board here in South Florida. And I remember one trans girl mentioned in 2013, and it was something that started with the trans girls. Um, now, I don't know if it was in South Florida or somewhere else, but it started in 2013. And every time I've gone to a meeting where there were gender fluid, gender binary, uh, gender outlaws, I have to always ask, do, do you, which, which pronoun do you prefer, or do you prefer no pronoun? and be called Z or Zim, because it does get confusing. And it's okay if you mess up, as long as you're putting in the effort, they understand that you don't know their history. And you have to make it clear to them to say, I don't want to offend you, so how would you like to be addressed? And it's okay to do that, and I do that with total strangers, just to go Me up too. and say, I don't know you, so I noticed that you stated you were gender fluid. So how would you like to be addressed? And some will say, today I feel like a woman. Another time they'll say, today I feel like a guy, and the, the male pronouns are fine, and then the female pronouns are fine, and then neither one is fine. So it's 
it's very confusing, especially when you haven't been around the community. And I've been there since 1970. I was at the first parade march in 1970. And I hung out with Asha for over 15 years. And I knew Sylvia very well. And I knew Gilbert Baker, who created the gay pride flag in 1976. So, you know. Thank you, Dr. James. Sure. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I just want to elevate Dr. James for a moment as well, because um, in, the, in the 80s, and clearly he is an expert um, in this category, um, and I'm a, I'm a generation after, uh, in our community, I always say this, are you family or are you an ally? Um, family is somebody who identifies as um, LGBTQIA+, and, a fam and, and we call it family because our community really reached in during the AIDS epidemic, to, to really look inward and for healing. And there were many people dying from AIDS and they were stigmatized. Um, and allies were there for us too, especially nurses. Um, but that's why we call each other family. And an ally is somebody who doesn't identify with one of those acronyms, but they, uh, uh, they are supportive of our community. And Dr. James is an expert uh, in that category in HIV and AIDS um, specialization. His, uh, his dissertation is, is really public. So you could look there. He's a great resource for that. Thank you, Dr. James, or James, I'm sorry, informal. Um, but happy pride to you as well. Okay, anything else? Um, I don't see any other questions. We've got lots of thank yous, lots of Great job. This is very beneficial. So it, everybody really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, we are coming up on almost time here. Uh, again, the session was recorded. I will be posting it in the comments uh, later on today. So you should have access to that. And you will also have access to Gary's uh, PowerPoint presentation as well. That way you can go ahead and click into his document and read up on all of those awesome people out there today. So I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day, and I um, hope to see you at, at our next webinar. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much, and happy Pride.